It's frightening to think how easily any one of us could end up in a police cell facing an interview. A drunken brawl, a car accident, not paying a bill. But what's it really like? It was horrible. When I, when I got put into a cell, I felt really, really scared and really cold. And I just, like, the whole time I was there, I think I screamed. However terrifying, the police interview is essential. Your objective is to get to the truth. And that may well be uh, that the person who is alleged to have committed the offence may not have committed it. So it's important that you are impartial and professional when you conduct an interview. Being arrested and thrown into a cold cell is bad enough. But why would someone confess to a crime they hadn't committed? They told me that if I'd admit to it, it'd be better for me. So I just turned around and said, well, if, if that's it, then I did it. Whatever you say I did, I did it. I just had to, start, I had to finish it. I couldn't take no more. Westwood Village, Nottingham, Easter 1985. Ten-year-old Wayne Keaton had been out playing on his BMX bike. It was getting dark, but Wayne had still not come home. The next morning, Wayne was still missing and a massive search was launched. Many villagers joined in, including teenager Mark Cleary. He and a friend searched a disused railway line. Whilst we were searching, we, we eventually did find something. Uh, my friend found it. Um, but I couldn't really understand um, how he did find it because it was on a side of a banking where I'd looked previously and there was nothing there. And then we changed sides, we got to the end of the railway bank, we changed opposite sides and walked back down again. And he found it, which was a shoe. Um, but like I say, I couldn't understand how because I'd already looked at that side before. Three days later, Wayne's body was found in the river under a bridge just yards from where the boys had searched. Mark Cleary worked as a cleaner in the local courthouse. He was just starting work one morning when he had a visit from the police. I was down in the staff room and two gentlemen walked in and uh, they asked me for my name and I gave them my name and they informed me who they were and told me that I was under arrest in the connection of the murder of Wayne Keaton. Philip Atherton, the friend with whom he'd been searching, had confessed to the murder, and he told the police that Mark was involved as well. I was placed in handcuffs. I was escorted through the building to a car waiting outside. Um, I was put into the car. Um, during the journey to the police station, um, I had the two police officers either side of me at the back seat. All these years on, Mark still remembers the terror of his arrest. I felt really scared. Um, although working in the court buildings and knowing magistrates, judges, police, I've worked in the police cells, cleaning police cells out. Um, there was an incident that where one of the police officers in the police cells actually locked me in the cell as a joke and I panicked and I just couldn't handle it. So for actually being arrested at work, I was scared. Mark's fear of being locked up is clear but he is not alone. In the early 1990s, a Royal Commission report showed that 20% of suspects at police stations were shown to be suffering from abnormal levels of anxiety and stress. The police interview, however, is an essential part of the investigation. After a person is arrested, he is taken to the custody suite, and the responsibility is then handed over to the custody sergeant as to ensuring that he is given his rights and to look after his welfare. For the first time suspect, even this routine is daunting. The police mugshot, the taking of fingerprints, and then the empty cell. Once I arrived at the police station, I was booked in and taken to the cell. I was left in the cell for maybe an hour. I had my shoes taken off, made my belt, my tie. I believe that was because like, you might wanna try and commit suicide. Um, I was left in there for a bit. 
I wanted to go for exercise, they let me go out on exercise for a little walk down. They wouldn't let me wear my shoes, although they took my laces out of them. It's the same for all suspects, not just suspected murderers, but petty criminals too. The experience of being arrested can be extremely intimidating. You know, you get searched and it's quite undignified to be searched and fingerprinted and have your photo taken. And um, you know, the cell is like bare and the bed's hard and, you know, after a while you think this isn't the one, you know, sitting in the cell waiting to be released. My heart was pounding. I was crying. I was petrified. Basically, I was petrified. Although I was 18, but I was young. And I just couldn't believe that what was happening was happening to me. One of the worst things for a suspect is the waiting and not knowing what's going on. It was horrible. When I, when I got put into a cell, I felt really, really scared and really cold. And I just, like, the whole time I was there, I think I screamed and I was just calling him every name under the sun and that, being really destructive. And, and then when I got interviewed, I felt really nervous and, and really on the spot and really intimidated, you know? It's a crucial time. The suspect wants to know what is going on and what, if anything, he might be charged with. The police have to try and find out the truth, sometimes from a suspect who won't talk. I was taken up to a room where the two officers were waiting. Um, they were both in plain clothing, so they were CID. Um, I was sitting uh, at one side of the table, at the end of a table, sorry, should I say. One officer was sitting at one side and the other officer was sitting at the other side, so basically I was in the middle. Um, each one was asking questions. Uh, maybe one was asking questions about the areas, the other one was asking, asking questions about what I did. Uh, the importance of the police interview uh, cannot be uh, underestimated. It, it serves to gather information, for example, with a suspect to lead to that conviction or to exonerate an innocent person. With a witness or victim, it tries to gather information to help bring about justice, but also, if it's done appropriately, to perhaps alleviate the stress that the, the victim's been going through by allowing them to talk about it in a fairly free and uninterrupted way and in a, in a properly designed uh, environment. During the interview, police have to get inside the mind of the suspect to know what they're thinking. No two suspects are the same, of course, but there are some common techniques for getting them talking. Psychologists have developed a technique of memory retrieval that the police use for interviewing witnesses. It's called the cognitive interview. There are a couple of other techniques that are sometimes used when the person's remembered everything they can. You do something really strange and you ask them to recall backwards, not by turning round, but by starting at the very last part of the event and then coming forwards in time. And that helps people remember some extra information. And sometimes you also say, OK, You've given me as much information as you can remember and you've told me that the man that committed the mugging had dark hair but you haven't yet been able to say whether it was short or long, what kind of style it had. Now imagine you're a hairstylist, I know you're not, but imagine you are. What extra could you tell me about the man's hair? So you change the witness's perspective to give you more information. You're clearly not asking them to make things up. The police have to establish the truth about the incident they're investigating. The suspect may have been involved, but not in the way the police think. So the same interview style that is used to help witnesses remember can be adapted for suspects too. OK, so who did get into the passenger seat? Then? Well, obviously this car has moved somewhat. CCTV followed the vehicle down Church Street, yeah. and that's where the police stopped it, at the bottom of Church Street in Mansfield. Yeah, I said they got in the car. I just wasn't driving it. Well, who was driving? I don't know. So who else was in that car? I don't know. You do realise, obviously, I'm asking these questions to clarify who the driver was of this vehicle. Well, I don't know. OK. And failing to answer them questions will make you liable to prosecution for stealing that car. Do you understand that? Not all suspects will agree to talk. When the police officers questioned me, um, I didn't say anything and that way I couldn't um, incriminate myself and I usually got away with it. So I was uh, tricked once. I was shown a video of myself in an incident and uh, I nearly slipped up but um, I still brushed it off. I think it's quite common uh, when you conduct interviews now that uh, more and more people 
uh, elect to answer no comment, whether that be based on a decision they've made or whether that be based on information or advice that has been given from the solicitor. So it, it is quite common uh, to come up against a no comment interview. A caution is given to everyone who's arrested. So I must warn you that it's done under caution, and that is that you do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which later on in court. Anything that you do say may be given evidence in court. Do you understand that? Yeah. I'll break that down for you. The first part is that you don't have to say anything. You can sit there and say nothing at all. Should this go to court, this case, and you're asked uh, again why you didn't give evidence now, here and now, any reasons for the offence, then the judge magistrate will wish to make up their own conclusions from that, from your silence, okay? And uh, obviously everything that's said on this tapes here can be listened to in court. Do you understand that? Right then, Sally. Uh, in that situation, uh, it is important that the officer conducting the interview um, continues, asks the appropriate questions, gives the appropriate warnings where necessary. Good preparation can help the police persuade a suspect to talk. Right. This vehicle then is driven off the marketplace and it's driven down Church Street where the police uh, intercept it down at the bottom near the church. Okay. Mm. Whose idea was it to take the car? What do you mean take the car? The vehicle. It wasn't your vehicle. Whose idea it was, was it? This bloke's car. He just pulled up in it, so I got in it. Another thing which is probably very important in terms of what makes a good interviewer is the ability to keep an open mind even when you've got quite a lot of information that shows that your initial feelings about this person, that they are guilty. You may have got more information, but to still keep an open mind, the ability to always to entertain an alternative explanation, that's the crucial thing, and, and we, we feel that's the essence of a good interviewer. In such an intense situation, the interviewer can often get affected by what they hear. It is important that you are professional, it is important that you do the job to the best of your abilities, but I'm not an uncaring person and I do have feelings and yes, things can disgust me, things can upset me, um, just like any other person. In serious cases, the arrested person will be interviewed over many hours, even days. But a key protection for the suspect is that they are allowed regular breaks. After the first interview, I was taken back down to the cell I was allowed to go out onto the exercise yard so I can have a cigarette. I was allowed a cup of tea and eventually at meal times I was allowed a meal. At that stage Mark still couldn't take it seriously. During that first interview I wasn't too bad because at the end of the day I thought it was going to be a joke. We were working at the police with the police and everything and with the coppers that I used to know there uh, played practical jokes on me. So at first I thought this was a practical joke. But this was no joke. Mark's problems had only just begun. After many hours in custody and a series of interviews, he was charged with the murder of Wayne Keaton. But Mark Cleary didn't kill Wayne. After the break, we look at the art of deception and how to detect a liar. And confessions. What makes someone like Mark Cleary confess to a murder he didn't commit? The suspect's been arrested, photographed, fingerprinted and locked in a cell. But the key part of the investigation is still to come. The police interview. A psychological game of cat and mouse. Lying is a daily life event. Research has shown that people lie once or twice a day. So people lie very often. Um, the result of that is that people are usually very skillful liars. Um, you may even say that people are professional liars. And that makes the job more difficult for a lie detector. The police come face to face with crooks and liars every day of their working lives. So are they experts in the detection of deception? When interviewing a person, you can often tell a lot from his body language, his or her body language, or their demeanour. Um, it is noticeable when you're interviewing a person who is not used to the system. It is noticeable when a person is frightened. At the opposite end of the scale, it is also noticeable when you're dealing with a person that you may have dealt with on numerous previous occasions who is well versed and does know the system. So obviously during the course of an interview, it is for you to establish a rapport with the person you're interviewing. It is for you to assess the body language 
and to um, to determine whether or not you you feel that they're lying. I think with experience it becomes like a sixth sense. Um, once you start questioning a person, you can soon establish uh, a belief that he is or she is telling the truth. Uh, in the same vein, it's easy to, to recognise when a person is telling blatant lies. At the University of Portsmouth, Professor Aldert Vridge is an expert in the psychology of deception. He teaches police forces in his native Holland and in Belgium the art of detecting deception. Professor Vridge is conducting an experiment at the university. A police officer has been asked to interview someone about the possession of a small set of headphones. The experiment is conducted twice. In one of the interviews, the woman has the headphones in her pocket. In the other, she doesn't. So in which interview is she lying? Do you have a set of headphones in your possession? No. Are you telling the truth? Yes, yeah. You don't have to show me, but tell me exactly what you have in your possession. Um, I have some keys, a set of keys. You forgot to mention the headphones, didn't you? I don't have any headphones. Are you telling me that you don't have a set of headphones in your possession? Yeah, don't have a set of headphones. And are you absolutely sure that you're telling me the truth? Yeah, I'm absolutely sure I'm telling the truth. The interview is then repeated. The interviewer doesn't know whether the woman actually has the headphones or not. And do you have the set of headphones in your possession? No, I don't have any headphones. Are you telling the truth? Yes, I'm telling the truth, yeah. You don't have to show me, but tell me exactly what you do have in your possession. Um, I have some keys, just some keys. A set of keys. You forgot to mention the headphones, didn't you? No, I don't have any headphones. So you're telling me that you do not have the headphones in your possession? I don't have any headphones in my possession. And you're absolutely sure you're telling me the truth? Yeah, positive. Positive. So was she lying in interview one or two? What does the policeman who took part in the experiment think? We'd well, be tempted to suggest that in the second interview, at a point when she was asked to uh, identify what she had on her, um, she appeared to avoid eye contact and look for the comfort of actually identifying what she had in her pockets. Um, which was a, a big swing from the first interview, that may be a point where she felt uncomfortable uh, to the point that she was lying. So is he right? My guess is when you ask people when they think that she was lying, that they would say that she was lying in the second interview. Because the behaviour she showed there is gaze aversion, is, is making movements, that is stereotypical deceptive behaviour. It is not the behaviour liars usually show, but it's the behaviour that people think that liars show. In fact, she was telling the truth in the second interview. She behaved in a very typical way. She was lying in the first interview, and was much stiller in that interview, and made more movements in the second interview. That's what you quite often see. Liars decrease their movements. What they try to do, they try to appear credible. And what people then do is start to, to act. But then you, can, you will get a kind of overacting. And that's happening over there. Overacting means that all insignificant movements you usually make, you, you, you try not to make them anymore because you think that that will make you look suspicious. And that's what, what she was doing as well. In those sort of studies we usually look at um, hand and finger movements people make, subtle movements with hand and fingers they make. I also did that in, in, in this particular interview and that person made more of those movements when she was telling the truth. Psychologists have found that even though police officers think they are good lie detectors, in reality they score no better than average. In some of our studies we try to find out how good police are at detecting lies. And usually you find that they are not very good at it. It depends on the group of police officers, but usually they are at the level of chance. About 50% of the answer they give is correct. Um, the highest score you may get is about 70% of the truths and lies they may detect. If you compare police officers, with, for instance, lay persons like students, you get the same scores. So police officers are usually as good as students are at detecting lies. But there's a difference in how confident people are in their ability to detect deceit. And police officers are more confident than students are at detecting lies, but they are not better. 
but there are some exceptions. For example, American research has shown that um, members of the Secret Service are better than other groups of police officers. What appears to be deceptive behaviour can just be a difference in culture. People from uh, Morocco and Turkey, for instance, they usually look away more often than white Caucasian people do. It might be the way around. It might well be that, that white Caucasian people look very often each other into the eyes, much more than people of other um, cultures do. Also, there are differences, for instance, in, in personal space, in, the, in how close people stand to each other. Black people have a smaller personal space than white people do. So black people stand closer to each other than white people do. And that might well make a very aggressive impression on white people. But there are ways of using body language to the best advantage. One good example I came across in the police interview is a question was asked, uh, what did you do on that particular day? And the suspect gave a detailed description of what he did in the morning, afternoon and evening. And what we found is that his behavior in the afternoon and evening when he spoke about that was totally different from his behavior when he spoke about the morning. And that's interesting because why should somebody change his behavior all of a sudden when he talks about a different day of the different part of the day? And one of the reasons might be that he was lying. Indeed, we could find afterwards that he was lying in that part of the interview. If you can't always tell a person is lying, can you at least see if they are telling the truth? An innocent person who is falsely accused will, will display many of the same stressful signs that a guilty person would display. And it's very difficult for the police or anybody else to determine whether the, the suspect's nervousness, for example, stems from his being falsely accused or from his, uh, his, his actually having committed the crime. The danger is that the police may see what they want to see. When the police are interviewing a suspect, it's very tempting for them to feel that the person who is in custody is in fact guilty. And so uh, the police are only human and they're, they're looking to try to achieve a result which fits in with their own uh, initial impressions. And so typically and historically, police interviewing around the world of suspects has focused on the, on the challenge of getting the person to confess or admit it. I think within the police organisation there's a great deal of kudos attached to any detective who, who can actually persuade a suspect to confess, especially the suspect is initially resistant to confess. If another officer is brought into the interview and he or she manages to persuade the, the suspect to, to confess, then that will be seen very well by the police officer's colleagues. It's a macho culture the police have been trying to change. The research that I conducted for um, my PhD showed that the most important thing that correlated with a confession in an interview was the evidence that the officer had to begin with. And that was a very important finding for us in this country because the traditional approach to suspect interviewing is to try and find ways of persuading the suspect to confess. And the consequences of that in this country was that it led to a number of miscarriages of justice and it led to a number of cases being overturned by our Court of Appeal. So what we say in our training is that you must concentrate on the interviews with the witnesses and the interviews with the victims. And it is as a result of that that you will have the information that you can plan your interview with a suspect. Although the suspect might be blatantly lying to the police, in the UK, at least, police are not allowed to lie to the suspect. In America, uh, the techniques that are used to elicit uh, a confession uh, involve doing things that would be outlawed in our country. So the whole approach to interviewing in America is uh, about persuading suspects to confess. They uh, can introduce uh, information as evidence to the suspect which uh, is completely false. Uh, that has been upheld by the uh, Supreme Court of the United States. In this country, we could not, for example, say to a suspect, your fingerprints have been found on this milk bottle, if they had not been found on that milk bottle. We could not, for example, say, somebody saw you near the scene, unless we had somebody who had actually identified the individual as being at the scene. So the approach that we take in this country is it's not about uh, persuading somebody to confess, it's actually about a search for the truth and it's about trying to obtain information from the suspect. Suspects have much better protection now than they used to. Interviews are tape recorded, sometimes even videotaped, and they have the right to a solicitor. 
Back when Mark Cleary was arrested, these protections were not in place. The, the first I got to get anybody to help me uh, was my boss Brian um, come on to the shift which I was on, um, asked where I were because I wasn't there. He was informed that I'd been arrested. So he phoned my parents. My parents then got in touch at the police station to find out which police station I should have got to. Uh, they phoned the police station. They was refused uh, to talk to me. Uh, so they got in touch with a firm of solicitors and it wasn't until I'd actually been charged before I'd actually be able to see anybody other than the police. By then, it was too late. Uh, it came to a point where I just couldn't take it anymore. And on the last interview, they basically said right from beginning to end what I'd done, how I did it. And they told me that if I'd admit to it, it'd be better for me. So I just turned around and said, well, if, if that's it, then I did it. Whatever you say I did, I did it. I just had to, I had to finish it. I couldn't take no more. But Mark hadn't done it. He'd had nothing to do with the murder of Wayne Keaton. So what makes perfectly innocent people confess to something they haven't done? In 1985, in a village in Nottinghamshire, there was a major police search to find missing 10-year-old schoolboy Wayne Keaton. The local community joined in, among them 18-year-old Mark Cleary. Wayne's body was found in a river, and Mark Cleary was charged and convicted of his murder. But he had confessed to a murder he didn't commit. Once I confessed, um, and I was told that I would be taken to magistrate's courts the following morning, I knew then that I was here to stay. I wasn't going home. Mark Cleary received a jail sentence for confessing to a murder he didn't commit. He was innocent. But it's a strange fact that most guilty people confess when confronted about their crime. But why do they confess when it will clearly get them into trouble? It's a question psychologists have asked too. The single most important reason why people confess to crimes they've done is the belief that there's no point in denying it. Even somebody who's committed a horrendous crime is still a human being and they've, they've been socialised into believing that, that things are bad and this getting it off your chest and facing the consequences does, apl does apply to many criminals as well as ordinary human beings. The third reason is fear of police custody or wanting to avoid the stress of the police interrogation or the police interview and in order to be released from custody because in most instances where people are interviewed by the police, once they made the admissions, they're free to go. Mark Cleary denied the murder of Wayne Keaton during his initial interviews, but the longer they went on, the more confused he became. The room that I was in, uh, it wasn't a very big room, maybe about 12 foot by 12 foot, a couple of filing cabinets, uh, a desk going across the, the floor from the centre. Um, I was at the end of the desk, one officer was sitting behind the desk and the other officer was facing him at the opposite side of the desk. During each interview, every time I went up to the room, the officers changed seats, I changed seats. So basically, it was just moving around. Um, I don't know whether they did it you know, for the fun of it or whether they did it because that's what they did. Um, but basically, once I was in the room, I was cornered. No matter which way, I was cornered. I will say the most frightening experience of it all was actually being interviewed, continuous. Um, it wasn't just a normal talking, asking questions and giving answers. There was quite a few raised voices. The atmosphere, you could cut it with a knife. Paul Smith is a clinical psychologist with an expertise in confessions. He knows the danger that can lie in police interviews, the fact that they're intense exchanges not comparable with normal conversations. I think the important thing to remember about the difference between a police interview and a, a normal interview or conversation is that it's not an ordinary conversation. 
This is not two chaps in a pub having a chat about the weather, football, cars, or the meaning of life, or, or whatever. Mark couldn't stand the pressure he was under any longer. I'm not quite sure how long it was I was at the police station before I actually confessed in a murder. I will say it was over 24 hours, and a lot of people will think 24 hours isn't a lot, but you put under pressure, 24 hours is a very long time. Mark was not physically threatened and he did get breaks, so why did he feel under such pressure? I think there's a danger if we, if we think that only the guilty people will confess. I think that we are ignoring the high pressure that is actually exerted on, sus on the suspect in the police interview. I think if psychology has taught us anything, it is that we are incredibly influenced by the social environment in which we find ourselves. And people do behave in unpredictable ways when they are in situations which are highly demanding. There was this uh, famous experiment carried out uh, almost 30 years ago at Stanford University when there were about 21 Stanford University students who were split into two groups. They were the guards and the prisoners. And the experiment was due to last for two weeks but had to be terminated after six days because the prisoners were suffering from such severe stress. And these were educated students who were considered to be fairly robust before the experiment couldn't cope with the stress and they become passive, they felt depressed and they were experiencing strong feelings of hopelessness. And that experiment clearly demonstrated that under certain circumstances being detained uh, or in, even in an artificial environment was extremely distressing to people. Mark Cleary eventually broke down and made what psychologists call a false confession. His reasons for doing so are typical of other cases of false confessions. When it comes to the end of the interviews and I confessed, I confessed because one, I'd had enough, I was drained. I just wanted to get home, I wanted to see my family. And two, they'd made it so convincing that I'd done it, that I was there. So it was like brainwashing. I actually thought that you, I must have done it then, because you've got everything to a detail. But I know I didn't do it. I think that many people think that in uh, a situation such as a police interview that they would never admit to anything or they would never certainly admit to anything that, that they hadn't done. If you look at um, some of the work of Solomon Ash, for, for example, on conformity and on uh, group pressure, you see that large numbers of normal people, people who don't have anything wrong with them, they're not abnormal in any way, will actually give answers to questions that they know are wrong. These are people who uh, find themselves in a situation where they've agreed to take part in a study which they think is to do with visual perception and they're asked to judge the length of lines. They're sitting in a group of others who they think are also participating in the study but in fact the rest are stooges and they're all giving the wrong answer. And so if you just imagine yourself in that situation, you're sitting in a group around the table and you can see that a particular line is shorter than the others, clear as day, but going around the table, everyone in front of you is saying, is giving the wrong answer, and then it comes to your turn, what do you do? Do you shuffle and look embarrassed and say, well, I'm terribly sorry, but I just see it differently? Or do you swallow hard and give what you know is the wrong answer? And the evidence is quite straightforward. In this sort of situation, many, many normal people give answers that they know are not true. Even though the suspects are under great pressure, if they haven't committed the crime, why would they confess? Psychologists say there are many reasons a suspect might do this. One reason is, for example, if they, if they wish to achieve notoriety, if there's a famous case, people will say, well, if I confess to this, I'll get in the papers, I'll be famous. And there are, whenever there's a, there's a high-profile murder, there are a large number of people walking to police stations saying, I did it, just to try and get the kudos. Between the years of 1969 and 1980, 13 women were brutally murdered in and around Yorkshire. Hundreds of crank letters of confession were received by police and newspapers before Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, 
was arrested and charged with the 13 counts of murder. One of the world's most notorious false confessors is Henry Lee Lucas. In the early 1980s, Henry Lee Lucas was suspected of two murders. He eventually confessed to two, those two murders, but subsequently confessed to many hundreds of other murders. I have no faith in the ghost hundreds and hundreds of confessions that he made to various murders throughout the United States. In fact, we know he could not have committed many of these murders. I assessed him in order to get his execution lifted and conducted a very detailed psychological evaluation. The interesting thing about Henry Lee Lucas is that all those large number of confessions that he made to the police gave him something important. Because when I spoke to Mr. Lucas, he clearly told me that he had no, great, no regrets about having made those confessions to the police, even if it meant he would be executed. The reason being that prior to making those confessions, he felt he was nobody. Nobody listened to him, nobody took an interest in him. Once he started making confessions, the police showed an interest. He has made many friends in prison and so forth, and that's been important for him. A few days before his execution, Henry Lee Lucas's sentence was reduced to life. A person may feel that as if they confess, even though they're truly innocent, they'll get out of the interview situation and then the truth will be revealed. Unfortunately, sometimes the truth is not revealed. Stephen Downing was arrested in Derbyshire in 1973 for the murder of 32-year-old Wendy Sewell. After more than seven hours of intermittent questioning, he confessed to the killing. Before his trial, he retracted the confession, claiming he had only confessed because he was cold, tired and hungry. 27 years later, he's a free man, having always maintained his innocence. Poor Mark really hadn't appreciated the massive mistake he'd made. After confessing, I, d I, d I didn't think anything badly was going to go off. I thought I was going to be allowed to go home. Mark soon realised he was going nowhere further than back down to the cells and then to court. I can't really describe how narrow I felt at the end after I confessed. There's just no way you can describe the feeling. You'd have to go through the situation to know what it feels like. There is no, there is no way you can describe it. There's anger, there's sadness, there's frustration. You just put it all into one, shake it up and just let it go. Mark was just 18 at the time and by his own admission, rather naive. I just got into my full time work. Um, I wasn't bright, I didn't leave school with any qualifications. And I'll quote something from what my boss said during an interview that I'm a bit green behind the ears. The police and the courts have now recognised that more needs to be done to protect suspects as vulnerable as 18 year old Mark. During interview, I think that people who are not as intellectually bright as others are, are more vulnerable for, I think, a, a number of very uh, obvious reasons. They have cognitively, they tend to have poorer memory, so there are more gaps in memory, and these memories are that these gaps are then more easily plugged. In social terms, they are used to other people knowing better than they do and essentially accepting messages from other people, accepting things that are implied and accepting things that other people say to them as being true. The law has been changed to make sure that suspects in custody are given better protection. The Police and Criminal Evidence Act actually brought in a number of protections for suspects. For example, it laid down the length of time that suspects could actually be held in custody. It laid down how often they had to go before they got a meal break. It laid down the fact that they could, if they wished to, have a, have a solicitor present. And most importantly, I think, in the case of vulnerable suspects, it, it allowed them to actually call for a responsible adult to be present at the interview so that they could not be perhaps persuaded to, to confess to a crime which they hadn't committed. One of the most important changes has been the tape recording of all interviews and in some cases videotaping. This means that police, suspect and solicitor all have a record of what happened. What has happened in England in the last 15 years is absolutely tremendous in terms of protection for suspects. I have not come across any other country 
where the same safeguards apply. The police have welcomed some of the changes for their own protection too. I would like to see the introduction of more videotaped interviews. I think that would be advantageous to the police in the sense that if that video was then subsequently played at court in front of a judge and jury, they would see the reactions of the person or suspect being interviewed. They would see the body language and they would see the demeanour in which they conducted themselves. And I think that would be advantageous sometimes because um, if somebody is just replying no comment or somebody is arrogant and rude and uh, abusive, then I think that to be shown on video would also make people appreciate what officers have to contend with when they do conduct some interviews. Even with these changes in place, there are still some suspects who change their minds after confessing. From my experience, um, hardened criminals, for want of a better description, or regular offenders, often retract confessions to play the system. By that, um, what I mean is that a person who is arrested and interviewed and admits an offence can often, on first appearance at court, plead not guilty. The reason, the reason for this may be that he is aware of the system, or he or she is aware of the system, having been through it before, and they, they know that having, having confessed to what they've done, it is prudent for them to plead not guilty on first appearance because if they are remanded in custody, they are kept on a remand wing and are given privileges. If they pleaded guilty at the first court and was convicted and sentenced on that day, their sentence would commence as a convicted prisoner. What happens in practice is there is no doubt that the majority of people who retract their confession have committed the offence, I mean, no doubt about that. We don't know how, what proportion of people who retract um, have made a genuine false confession, we do not know. That proportion is probably quite small. After nearly 10 years in prison, Mark Cleary's conviction was quashed by the Court of Appeal. Waiting for the judge's decision during the appeal was agony for Mark. I was sent back down to have my dinner. I couldn't eat my dinner. I was pacing the floor, wondering what was happening. The hour just felt like days. I eventually went back up into the appeal court. Again, the Crown Prosecution said they have no more evidence. And the judge turned around and says, I find this case unsafe and unsatisfactory, and I quashed the conviction. And boy, did I feel good. I felt so good that I just wanted to shout, scream, go over and kiss them on the cheek, shake their hands. But I know I couldn't do none of that. So I had to be respectable. I still felt some, a bit as though I was still convicted because I was still in the court building. It wasn't really until I was actually let out the court door out onto the street that then I realised I was free. But Mark lost some of the best years of his life in prison and rebuilding it hasn't been easy. I live, at the moment, I live at the coast. Um, I moved there because it was quiet time. It was in the winter time. Um, breathing in summer, it's not too bad. But basically I got away from everybody. My day-to-day -day things are just general maintenance of my home. I do nothing else. I used to have an hobby, I used to make Fabergé eggs, which are very delicate things. I can't do that no more, because every time I start to work on an egg, it brings back prison, and that's where I learned to make them in prison. Today, Mark is still haunted by his memories. There's times I can sit, and I feel so frustrated anger, sadness, everything. I just feel it all. And there's nowhere or anyone that I can give it to. Because nobody deserves to feel all those emotions all at once. 
but I have to. So who gives people authority to give it to me? Mark's life will never be the same again. I think after being convicted of murder of a child, I don't think anybody will ever get over it. They will learn to accept it, but they'll never get over it. Never. <laughs>